being near them, but by dwelling within them. God in you. Now, what should believers do while we await Christ's return? Be devoted together. Be devoted to what? If you want to be a devoted family member, a healthy family member to Christ and his church, we've got the formula for you right here in Acts chapter 2. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. A healthy, growing family member is devoted to the apostles' teaching. Uh, the early church would gather regularly, they would even daily, to listen and learn from the apostles. If you wanted to learn about Jesus and his teachings, you, you better, you're going to find your feet, or you, you would be sitting at the feet of the apostles. And, and why is that? What was so special about them? Couldn't, it, couldn't just, we just learn from anybody? No, because not everybody was handpicked by Jesus to follow him. To spend three years day and night with Jesus, even 40 days post-resurrection learning from him, being trained by him and imitating him. He specifically chose them for this purpose, that they would ensure that the teachings of Christ and the gospel would be guarded and would be passed on and would go forth to all generations. With Jesus gone, they were the source. It would be foolish not to get your, your information and your teaching about Jesus from anyone else. They are the primary sources, right? They were eyewitnesses to the words and the works of Jesus. Makes me think of that game that maybe you recall. Uh, I don't know if the older generation does, but we play this game in elementary called the telephone game. Where there's someone on the end, they, the kids would all line up on the room, one end to the other, and the first person would repeat some kind of phrase and, and say it and whisper it to the ear of the next kid and they would try to pass it on down the line to see if they could have the correct phrase at the very end. And, and we know that by the end they were just speaking gibberish and it was, it was utter nonsense what they were saying. What, what needed to happen there? The, the person at the end, they needed to run to the kid to the front and get the, the factual actual. But, but then I guess the game would be kind of boring, wouldn't it? <clears throat> The best way to get true, faithful, and accurate teachings about Jesus Christ was to go to the source, was to go to the apostles. They, they, they were the ones who were with Jesus. They heard what he said. They saw what he did, the miracles he performed, and, and they were sure to remember and to record as much as possible about the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. So Christ gave the authoritative teaching, and the apostles were the authoritative messengers. The Apostle John, he put it this way to the letter, the letter to the churches. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And this fellowship of ours is with the Father and with his Son. We proclaim to you what we have seen, what we have heard. They were different. They were unique. They, and, and, the reason, and they were called and qualified to be apostles because they were with Jesus. They saw and heard. Now, what would they have taught? It says there, there were, really, I think there were three essential doctrines that they were teaching, which are still important to this day, which they still hold true. One, I believe they were teaching, they continued to teach the authority of the Bible. Now, they only would have had the Old Testament at the time, but it was the assumed authority on the truthfulness of God who spoke to the world through it, and specifically, they would have clarified the messianic, prof the messianic prophecies and the fulfillment of all things in Jesus Christ. They were teaching that God's ultimate plan and purpose for all people on earth was to be found and fulfilled in Christ. Two, they would have taught without reservation about the nature and the character of Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God and the Messiah, truly God and truly man, the second person of the Trinity. And last, they would have taught about the gospel of grace. How does, how does a man get right with God? How are they justified 
before God. They're justified by faith in Jesus Christ who died for their sins on the cross and he rose again, just like the song we just sang. Like a rose trampled on the ground, he took the fall and thought of us above all. And there's no other way, this gospel of grace. You, you can't add to it. You can't take away. You can't change anything about the good news about the Messiah. And so minimally, it was these three essential teachings or doctrines that they, the apostles passed on, and these first Christians were devoted to it. They couldn't get enough. But now, let's jump ahead to our day, right? We're not living in the first century. We weren't there. How can we ever get so close to the teachings of Jesus? How can, how can we ever be sure that we're getting the true and accurate teachings of Christ like the early church? My friends, something greater is here. We have the whole counsel of God right here. We, we have the compiled teaching of all the apostles as they were taught and moved by the Holy Spirit. These, these very words of scripture here, which means this comes from God and not from man. Church, if, if this is God's word, if he is speaking, are you listening? And are you devoted to it like these first Christians were? Because I don't think we can be devoted to God if we're not devoted to his word. I'm sure you've heard this before. <clears throat> if if um, all throughout life you've been confused and you're feeling like you're a stranger on earth, maybe you felt lost in darkness, experiencing pain, and, and you feel like God's not there. Well, and then God pens a letter to you. And so you go outside and you go to your mailbox and you open it up and, and you take it out. And it's a, it's a big piece of mail. It's a real thick book. It's not what you were expecting. It's the whole Bible. And it's probably like a study Bible, so it's really thick. And it's this love letter from God to assure you of who he is and his love for you and to set everything straight and then you're going to go into the house and say, wow, I'm really excited about this letter from God. He finally spoke to me. Eh, maybe I'll read it later. And you put it on the shelf. And for years and years, it's just collecting dust, right? Some of us, that's what we've done. We've, we truly believe God is speaking through the Bible. And it's his love letter, but, but we haven't been willing to even crack it open. Some of us need to pick up that Bible and dust it off. Or it's 2024. You know, you, you, can, you can also turn your Bible on these days. You, you, if you just pull out your phone, you have the Word of God right on your phone now. All you have to do is find the right website, download the app. We're, we're, we're blessed with so many rich resources giving us God's Word. Especially in light of the fact that there are so many, there is nations and people, people groups that don't even have a page of Scripture in their native tongue, in their, in their own language. God has been good and gracious to us to give us the gospel and give us his truth passed down from the apostles in the Holy Scripture. I think it's simple and clear in this passage that you must be devoted to God's word if you're going to be devoted to God. How else is he going to speak to you? How will he teach you about himself? Don't rely on your dreams. Don't rely on your intuition. Don't rely on your senses and, and, and sense of reason alone because they can fail you. We probably know that sometimes. It's like, I don't even know where my keys are. How am I going to trust everything, you know? But trust in the authoritative and the revealed word of God. Church, if we're going to be like this thriving early church, we must be devoted to his word in order to build each other up in the Lord but also, if it's our desire to bring God to the lost and dying world around us, how else can it be done but by and through the truths of Christ passed on to us through the scripture? And if you need some inspiration, I'm not sure anyone loved and meditated on God's word more than King David. Um, and then also just look at all the benefits that you gain when you soak in and you live out the word of God. He says, oh, how I love your law. I love your instruction. I love your word. I love your truths. All day long it is my meditation. 
Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies. Do you need some wisdom? For they are always with me, for I have more insight than all my teachers. Your testimonies are my meditation. And I discern more than the elders, for I obey your precepts. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. May our heart's desire be like David's and the early church who were devoted to the word of God. Healthy, growing family members are devoted to the fellowship. This is a beautiful Greek word, you've probably heard of it, called koinonia. When you came to Christ, you were added to him. Rather, should I say, he adopts you and he adds you to his family, where you get a bunch of brothers and sisters like us in here with this new and unique family called the church, the forever family of God. So you look around and, and say, hi, we're not, we're not going away. We're not going away. You gotta deal with these people for all of eternity because the spirit is thicker than blood. And this word for this tight-knit community, we're supposed to have this coin in we, we now are to share in and be devoted to koinonia, to the fellowship with one another. I apologize for the screen. Come back next week and this should not be a problem. Throw out the computer, throw out this projector, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, where was I here? It, it's more than a social club, this koinonia, the church. It's, it's more than a hangout. It's a partnership. It's sharing together. It's communion together. We belong to Christ, right? Well, now then, as one body, we belong to each other as well. As we share in the life of Christ, as we share our lives together, and we share in the lives of unbelievers, that's what happens. That's plenty. And God forbid that it's only Sunday mornings, one hour a week, that we get to meet together and, and get together. That's, that's not much for community, right? That's not much of a family if we see each other one hour a week. I'm just saying. The Apostle Paul, he was, he was called by Jesus to go and travel and share the gospel and plant new churches. He would say this. He would say it this way to his beloved brothers and sisters in Christ at the church of Thessalonica. He would say, we cared so deeply that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives as well. That is how, beloved, you have become to us. And his point was this, that as an apostle, he had a privilege. He had a right. He had the, he had the authority that came from Jesus. And, and as I've shared, the, the apostle, they had this authority of God in ways that you and I, we, we've never had that. And he, he could come and essentially he could almost be, demand to be compensated. You know, give me the best. A, a worker is worth his wage. He could have expected the best and, and as an apostle expected to be honored and respected and cared for. But he didn't come greedily. He didn't come to take what, just what he could from these Christians. Instead, he came to share the greatest treasure ever with them. The gospel of God. But they became so precious to him that he would give them all he had. That's the beauty and the power of the gospel, including his very life. He would share his life with them. By the way, where does he get that from? Where did he learn that from? He learned that from Jesus Christ himself, who came to earth, who came to us. And as a king and as a ruler, he could have demanded all things. He could have called all people to bow and worship. He could have destroyed the nations, yet instead he gave of his life. He gave of himself that we may gain, that we may join and share in the fellowship. Actually, uh, I showed this verse earlier. Uh, this, this same word is used in 1 John 1 where it says that we have, we have koinonia. We actually have this with, with God the Father and with Jesus Christ. Paul can share his life with his dearly beloved brothers and sisters in Christ because Christ gave of his life that Paul may benefit, that Paul may, be, may gain and be reconciled to God. You see the beauty of koinonia and the fellowship. And the essence is this sharing in, this giving of one another because Christ set the example for us. He shared all he was and all he is 
and we get to benefit from that from, for all of eternity. And that's what God calls us to have with one another. We, we use this word fellowship, but it's, it's more than teaching. It's more than just prayer. It's more than theological discussions, though it's not less than that. I think some of us, when we think of fellowship, it just means oh, we're just going to eat some food together. That's only part of it. And these are all good things and these are necessary, but koinonia is about giving of your very lives with King Jesus at the center. Not withholding anything from the church that, that Jesus gave his life for. Paul also wrote, and he commended various churches who gave to other churches and other Christians out of their poverty. It happened in Philippians, the, the church of Antioch. They gave what little they had to build up the body of Christ. The early church was poor, but they were still willing to share because they cared so deeply. They were willing to give. And why? Because they were willing to give it all because Christ gave it all. The willingness to give and share was a sure sign of koinonia, the fellowship. Many of you, especially uh, older parents, you're probably thinking, you have koinonia with your kids. They, they think you're like a never-ending ATM machine. They, they, you, they don't mind at all coming to you and asking for you to share. Isn't, isn't that true? Even after, you're probably thinking, I, I've given all I can give. I, I don't have any more. Well, I, I pray that, that it's not in vain, that you've been able to teach your kids generosity, that they would live that out as, as they get older as well. But some of you, I believe your hearts are aching for koinonia because I think God has put that in your hearts. He's put that in all of our hearts by design. God himself enjoys koinonia with Godhead. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And it, it, this longing within our hearts, we want to belong. We want to share. We want to join in the mission. And sometimes we're also in need, also. We need to receive. Well, I would say don't, don't go looking for that in the wrong places. Especially if you call yourself a Christian. This, this is the family of God. This is the people of God, and it should be our joy and delight to share, to experience koinonia, this fellowship. May we share our very lives to build each other up in Christ and that he may get all the glory. But let's be honest. I think we need to be challenged in this area, don't we, church? We've, in our Western world, we've been taught that independence is better, that, that isolation is freedom. We're living separate, independent lives so we must be careful. The early church was devoted to the fellowship, to their brothers and sisters in Christ, and may we be also. But healthy, growing family members are devoted to the breaking of bread. I think we uh, were devoted to the breaking of bread. We had our potluck last week that we had. It, it was really good. And because of the koinonia, I was eating homemade mac and cheese, I think, like three days into the week. So, so thank you, whoever brought the mac and cheese. <clears throat> but is that what's going on here? Is that all that's going on? Was the church devoted to, to potlucks? You know, some of us Baptists may think so, that that's what's going on. But I think it's safe to say that this is for sure referring to the Lord's Supper or communion. The, the week before Easter, uh, Damascus Church, we had our first communion together, where we shared the bread, which symbolized Christ's body broken for us. We drank the cup, which signified his blood poured out for us. So communion remembers Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, lamb slain for us and resurrected from the dead, that all those who believe and partake of Christ shall be raised just as, as he was. Communion is a beautiful and powerful reminder of how, God, how far God had to go to come and rescue us and bring us back to him. But I believe this passage also means sharing of a meal together. Um, I read several different commentaries and it said likely included some kind of communal meal after they share the Lord's Supper. So that's what we do here. We take communion and we share a meal afterwards. So if you missed the mac and cheese from last week, 
You know, I'd encourage you to stick around for our meal that we're going to have after church today down in the fellowship hall. I can't promise you that the mac and cheese is going to be there, but you might get a slice of pizza. Um, I'm sure the early church was, was chowing down on pizza after the service was over. So we're simply just carrying on the tradition to the church of this breaking bread together, breaking pizza together. The early church was devoted to prayer. I can. It's working. There we go. Devoted to prayer. Healthy, growing family members are devoted to prayer. The church met regularly, they, even daily at the temple, at prescribed times to pray. Later in the text, we see that they're going house to house. And it seems like they grasped the idea that Paul later wrote to the church in Thessalonica. He said to pray without ceasing. What is prayer? A simple definition is, is a conversation with God. How, do, how, does he, how does he speak to us? A little quiz from, from, from earlier. Something else that we're devoted to. His word, right? Speaks to us through his word, and we respond. That's prayer. God speaks to us. We speak to God. And, and how cool is that, by the way? D did you know that it's only through Jesus that we get to speak to God? At least in a way that that he hears and he receives and he's pleased to answer. Hebrews reminds us that through Christ, we can now approach the throne of grace boldly and with confidence. We may enter into the king's presence. Man, mankind was kicked out of God's presence in Adam, right? But we have been brought near now through Christ. I think there's many people, perhaps in here, struggling with God questioning if he's there, if, if, if he hears, and does he care? And, and I would say they're, they're crying out through the wrong channel. That's what's going on. He's not on your frequency. You're, you're telling God to tune into your frequency, but he's on his own frequency. And the only way you have access to it is by and through Jesus, the mediator and the high priest. What is a priest? A priest is someone who connects you to God. Go to the priest. Not like the Catholic Church. There's only one true, high, faithful priest. It's Jesus. And we can come boldly before him. And not only that, he is delighted when we do so. Why did the early church pray? And why should we pray? First of all, we are dependent creatures. We are created by another. One who, is ne who, is, who was never created, has no needs, and yet meets all of our needs. Every breath we draw, every beat of our heart, every bite of food that enters our mouth, every sip of water that we take, is it not from the grace of God and his provision? Amen. Amen. We pray because we need God to survive. But we also pray for wisdom and guidance. Another classic Bible verse, many of you probably heard this. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways. Knowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Amen. Without praying, without trusting God, without walking in his ways, you're not going on a straight path. Sorry. We need the Lord for wisdom and guidance, and we need his word and truth to lead us in all our ways that we may walk on the straight path that he calls us to in this life. We are fools without him. The, the Bible says that the fool says in, in his heart, there is no God. And, and that's not name calling, by the way. That's just a description. And the, the fool does not pray and he does not acknowledge God. And he goes his own way. And if you haven't figured it all out already, which I hope you ha haven't had to learn this hard lesson. But all our ways apart from God only lead to death and destruction. The Bible also refers to mankind like sheep. Now, I don't think that's a compliment. Um, it doesn't seem like we're given the best descriptors in, in the Bible and God's word. Now, Jesus Christ is the good shepherd who takes care of his sheep. And that's a compliment to him, right? But, but for us, sheep might be the dumbest animal there is, the dumb, dumbest animal ever. They're prone to attack. They're prone to wander off from their shepherd. They're prone to just like run off the cliff and not know it if the shepherd won't guide them. 
We need prayer because we need the Lord's guidance in this life. We could go on and on about why we should pray. There's more reasons that we have time for. But honestly, I think the most important reason for prayer is intimacy with God. Communion with God. I mentioned that word koinonia earlier. Well, John used that same word. He says we are to have this sharing and this fellowship with God himself only through Christ and only through prayer in this life. Which, as I was preparing this, it kind of made me ponder this idea of prayer. Maybe you have as well. But it seems like there's going to be a day, a day in heaven where we no longer pray. Can you imagine that? This seems weird. But, but it makes sense to me because our faith will be sight. You don't have to hope and pray for something that you see is right in front of you, right before you. But God's will and purpose in this life is that we have koinonia with him by and through prayer. Prayer in this life is the opportunity to know Jesus and to prepare for eternity, to bear the fruit for Jesus that lasts forever. And so take advantage of prayer now while you have a chance. <clears throat> so do you pray? Do you know how to pray? Well, I can um, gladly report to you that my, my children, Calvin and Judson, my four-year-old and just turned three, they know how to pray. So if you want to come over and come over to our house for, for a meal, you can bet that they are going to pray, they will want to pray, and you can credit my daughter Bree for teaching them how to pray. She discipled them in this prayer, and it goes something like this. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this food. Please help us to have a great day today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every time. Every time. You can know that prayer too. Actually, I think uh, they're not too sure about that phrase. Please help us to have a good day today. That's a lot of words, a lot of syllables. So, and it's kind of an abstract idea. Like, what, what do you mean? The day? Is that today or yesterday? So they kind of change it to something like, please let us to a great day today. And, and so even after we tried to correct them over and over, but uh, they're doing great, though. I, I would say it's better than uh, one of my mom's friends who taught me to pray when I was growing up. She's, when we eat a meal, she would say, rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, thanks for the grub, yay, God. Um, but she also had the wisdom to tell me this, that God made dirt and dirt don't hurt. So um, I think she was a pagan or something. I'm still, I'm still praying for her soul today. But the early church was devoted to prayer because they wanted to know Jesus, they wanted to love Jesus, and they wanted to follow and obey Jesus, and they wanted the world around them to know Jesus. That's a, I don't think you need any more reason to pray and to be devoted to prayer than that. Do you believe in prayer? Do you believe it's powerful? I think one of our problems in the modern day church is that we doubt God. We doubt prayer, even though he says it's only through prayer that mountains can be moved. You can move mountains through prayer. And I'm not talking about prosperity gospel. I'm talking about accomplishing the will and the purpose of God to bring salvation in his kingdom and his life and his hope to this world. So the most effective way we can pray is when we pray according to God's will. Pray according to God's will. It's when we are praying and asking for the very things he wants to give you. Many of us are praying, we're asking for things that God never wants to give us because it's going to lead us away from Him, yeah. not closer to Him. True. Don't be surprised if He's saying no to those prayers. He's good, right? He'll never give you that, and you can thank Him for that because He's all wise and He's all loving. Maybe what we, we need is wisdom to pray for different things. Here's my recommendation, and this is what I try to do in the pastoral prayer. If you want to pray powerful, effective prayers, that pleases God, it's pleasing to his ears, I'd encourage you to pray Bible-based prayers. God teaches us throughout the scripture how to pray. Listen to this. Turn it, turn it into a prayer. It's really easy from Psalm 86, 3 and 4. He says, Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. How can we pray this? It's pretty straightforward. Basically, just as it's, as it's written, God, be merciful to me. I call out to you. I pray to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant because it's to you, Lord, I'm lifting up my soul. Who doesn't want joy? 
who doesn't want peace? We're just praying for that. Lifting up soul is an expression of how intense and how constant someone's looking to God at the core, from the core of their being, that God would hear and respond and they would find relief. They are entrusting themselves to God in prayer. You can take anything in scripture and turn it into a prayer. Pray the very things that you know God wants to answer and, and that he plans to answer. And, and, you know, um, and you know what he wants to answer is our inter intercessory prayers. What's that mean? It means our prayers for others. In particular, our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we are devoted to prayer, then we also have to be devoted to praying for one another. You may have heard this before. Intercessory prayers is love on its knees. Are you praying for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Unfortunately, um, I think we've been deceived. We think prayer would be a waste of time. It's ineffective, that God isn't here, he's not doing anything about it. But as I said, prayer, it moves mountains. But again, and I may have heard Pastor Roberts talk about this earlier as I passed through the door, he said something about, I think we need to pray more. If we do, if we assess ourselves honestly, I think we, we know we're not praying enough personally or as a church together. But if we come together as a church and we're devoted to prayer, I believe we're going to see the mighty hand of God move in a powerful way. Every revival in history that ever occurred first began with a season of prayer. There's no revival without prayer. So on that note, can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? I hope many of you today will come to me after service. I'm asking, I'm telling you I want to pray for you. So please come to me today and say, Nate, this is going on. Please be in prayer for me. It will be my joy to go to the throne of God for you, to petition him that he will be gracious and merciful to you. And so I pray you do the same for others as well. We are to, as, as we are devoted to the word, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, as a healthy growing family members of the church of God, I believe God is going to do some amazing things in you and in this church and in the community. He's going to leave us in awe of his greatness and his love and his power as we persevere in these things. What can we expect? What is God going to do as we devote ourselves to these? Let's look. It says here in Acts 2.43, a sense of awe came over everyone, and the apostles performed many signs and wonders. It says a sense of awe came over everyone. Now, now Jesus, remember, Jesus gave the apostles a very unique ability and a very special calling through the power of the Holy Spirit. They were performing miracles in the likeness of Jesus. Now you and I, we're not able to do that, but it doesn't mean miracles can't happen today by the power of God. This is God's world. But it's God who does the miracles, not man. Make, make no mistake, we can still see the awe and the power of God today in and through the church. God can do signs and wonders. I, I talked a little bit about it last week. <clears throat> I think the biggest change the biggest miracle that you will ever witness is when you see someone who is dead set against Jesus, who one day 